Good evening. We're glad to see all of you here for tonight's program. This program is presented in partnership with the Santa Cruz Public Libraries on the library's Zoom webinar platform. Thank you to library staff members, Sarah Jones, Jessica Goodman, and Victor Willis for your assistance. As many of you know, society volunteers are again staffing the desk in the genealogy room at the downtown library. We invite you to come to the library to use our comprehensive genealogical reference collection during library open hours. Just a reminder, patrons must wear face masks at the library regardless of vaccination status. In other news, the Society's DNA Special Interest Group held its first post-pandemic or mid-pandemic maybe meeting earlier today. The DNA SIG will hold its next meeting on Tuesday, October 5. Look for reminder notices about the time and place of the next DNA session. The Society's Irish Special Interest Group will be resuming soon as well. Sean Conley will advise us of the date, time and place of the Irish Special Interest Group session soon. In a moment, I'll introduce tonight's speaker. First though, I want to let you know about next month's program. In October, Kathy Nielsen will join us once again and will show us how to cope with some of the overwhelming issues of dealing with our photos in her presentation entitled A New Life for Old Photos, Identifying, Organizing and Restoring Photos. Join Kathy as she shares tips on how to identify, organize, and restore old photos. She will introduce us to Restore, a new and easy photo editing application. In November, I am pleased to announce that Terry Jackson, a member of the Monterey County Genealogical Society, will show us the ins and outs of using FamilySearch.org. Terry will let us know about some of the new tools there and will explain how we can get the most out of our research at that site. As many of you know, as many of you know we had hoped to resume in-person programs at the library beginning in November, but with COVID still surging, we have determined to continue to offer our programs through November via Zoom. Jessica Goodman, Sarah Jones, and Victor Willis with the Santa Cruz Public Libraries have graciously and generously committed to continuing to support our programs as they have been doing so ably throughout 2021. We have scheduled the Genealogy Society Holiday Luncheon for the first Thursday of December at the Crow's Nest, just as we have done in the past prior to the pandemic. I'm sure you join me in anticipating the resumption of that joyful event. Details for making reservations for the holiday luncheon will be forthcoming in due course. The holiday luncheon will be in place of a monthly program for that month. Tonight, we are pleased to be joined by our own Lisa Robinson. Many of you know that Lisa has been editing our newsletter, Redwood Roots, for the past several years. Lisa also serves as the volunteer curator for the San Lorenzo Valley Museum and is president of the San Lorenzo Valley Historical Society. Lisa and her family have lived in Boulder Creek since 1990. She is a member of the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History, MA, Landmark Committee, and also the MA Publications Committee. She serves on the board of the Genealogical Society of Santa Cruz County and is the communicator for Santa Cruz County Researchers Anonymous. In addition, Lisa has authored two books on San Lorenzo Valley history and was the editor for the Ma publication entitled Redwood Logging and Conservation in the Santa Cruz Mountains, a Split History. She has curated multiple exhibitions on the history of the Santa Cruz Mountains and writes regularly for the Santa Cruz Mountain Bulletin and the San Lorenzo Valley Post newspapers. This evening, Lisa will take us digging in the archives. Local archives can be a source of valuable information for genealogists wanting to tell a rich history of their ancestors. They often contain diaries, scrapbooks, hotel registers, club and organization minutes, and many more, and much more. Lisa will take us through a journey exploring the archives in the collection of the San Lorenzo Valley Museum to demonstrate how such a collection can be used to paint a more vivid picture of our ancestors from wherever they may have hailed. Please join me in giving a warm Zoom welcome to Lisa Robinson. 
So I want to thank everybody who's here. For, so for those of you who are new to the San Lorenzo Valley Museum, uh, the museum is owned and operated by the San Lorenzo Valley Historical Society. And we have been a nonprofit uh, for over 40 years, since 1976. Our mission is to preserve and share the history of the San Lorenzo Valley, but we do that in the context of Santa Cruz County. We have two galleries, um, both in buildings that are listed on the National Register of Historic Places, the Faye G. Bellardi Memorial Gallery in Felton, which is the old Santa Cruz Public Library in Felton, and the Grace Episcopal Gallery in Boulder Creek. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that both galleries are located on the ancestral lands of the Ohlone people and are part of the traditional territory of today's Amamutsun tribal band. Both locations house permanent and temporary exhibitions. Both hold collections of objects and archives and photographs. The Bellardi Gallery also houses a reference library. Now, the material I'm going to go through on the next few slides is going to be a bit dry, and I apologize for that, but I want to give you an idea of how information is organized in the typical historical society so that you know how to approach that organization or institution when you ask questions about your relatives. So what's an archive? It's a place, and this is, this is from um, the National Archives, a place where people can go and gather facts, data, evidence, the primary source materials, letters, reports, notes, memos, photographs, diaries, etc. What does our archive contain? Well, it's got published and unpublished material, it's primarily paper, increasingly born digital, and it's sometimes copies. So copies, what do I mean by copies? Well, it used to be the case that there wasn't very much online. So past um, members have gone to places like the Library of Congress and made copies of maps, et cetera, that, that were available which are now available online. So we do actually have those as hard copies in the, um, in, in the collection. We do have copies from other local institutions uh, where they have wanted us to keep a copy in case of a disaster. So for example, we have the um, K collection of photographs uh, that uh, ha is housed at the uh, Capitola Historical Museum as a secondary archive for that collection. We also have um, collections of information that are part of a research collection. So for example, the California Powder Works, Barry Brown um, did an enormous amount of research collecting information from multiple archives, including the Hagley archives in Delaware and brought them together as a California Powder Works research collection. So you only have to go to one spot uh, to be able to access all of the information pertaining to that particular organization. Now, how do we operate? Well, we those the, the archives are available on site by appointment. And the way we work at this archive is that you request something, we make a digital copy and we give it to you. Um, the reason we do this is to increase the number of uh, archives that are available digitally to our patrons. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a way that we can guarantee that we grow our digital archive. Now we also do have a reference library. I mentioned that it's at the uh, Bellardi location. It's all published material. It's Californiana primarily, although there are uh, there's quite a collection of North American Indian um, uh, information too. It's referenced on site only. It may be photographed. So if there's a page that you're really interested in, you can photograph that page. It's available during gallery hour, uh, gallery open hours or by appointment. It's about five, 850 books. 
And that will grow because we'll be bringing in reference material from the um, other location to grow that, that library. And it's cataloged on libraryThing.com. So here's libraryThing.com. Um, what you'll see in the first column is something that says other call number system. That is our catalog system. Um, so a catalog number uh, includes an accession number, basically the gift number, which is the year of the donation and the gift number of that year. So in this case, it was the 20th gift of 2020 and every item in that gift, all 850, get a unique number. All right, we're gonna talk about what's a catalog. I know this is, this is, this is dry, but you'll understand why I'm, I'm talking about this. So catalogs are built upon accessioning, which is the most important part of the process. It's the legal transaction that transfers the donation from the donor to the institution. So one accession number is, in, uh, is in assigned to an entire gift. Each item in the gift is then given a unique catalog number. There used to be um, paper-only systems, uh, but today they're digital databases. Institutions such as ours are hybrid. We have not moved all of our paper copies to a digital system, and that's important. Um, so we use the this system called Past Perfect. Um, Past Perfect claims on their website to be the world's leader in museum um, and con uh, contact management software and used by 11, over 11,000 museums. It is extremely affordable. It's very comprehensive and it's very easy to use. It has its limitations, however. So we've been using this since 2003 and other local institutions use it to, to one degree or another. Some use it just for their collections. Some use it just for the contacts, but for example, the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History uses it, Capitola Historical Museum, uh, the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History uses it, among others. Now, I want to talk to you about its capabilities, bearing in mind that even those institutions that use an alternative database likely have the same or very similar capabilities. The goal here is to show you what's possible, but also to show you why you should not rely on it. So these are the fields we're gonna cover. You can see this, we've got, I've highlighted the collections, objects, photos, archives, and the library, accessioning, and then research by people, people biographies, and contacts. First, let's talk about donors. Perhaps your relative is getting ready for retirement, looking for things to do that interest them. They probably will become a member of their local historical society or, or a local historic or a society to which they associate, where they grew up, whatever. During their retirement, they downsize. And I have seen this over and over again. Afraid that something might happen to a prized collection that their kids will just recycle, they approach a historical society with their beloved collection, scrapbook, brochures. It happens over and over again. You can see from this record that this person has had a lot of interaction with our um, historical society. They've made donations, they've been a member, they have accessions and loans, um, they've been active. And that's also an important point because many societies, not just historical societies, often video or photograph or record um, events such as barbecues, potlucks, etc. So there may be information there that you can gain from a society that your relative has been a member of. 
This person, however, has made donations of artifacts to the institution and they are reflected in these accessions here, okay? Now, if we click on a single accession, here's an accession, we can see that these are the catalog records. So um, we've got over 43, I don't know how many in this accession, but you know, we've got photographs, we've got drawings, um, we've got receipts. Uh, each individual item has been accessioned. So maybe the first question you should ask is, has my relative made a donation to the archive? Now, this only works if the donor information has been placed in the contact database, because you can add an accession without linking the donation to a contact. So it's not a guarantee. Here is a specific catalog record with tags mm -hmm. noting the people associated with that item. So this is one item in an accession mm -hmm. where the people have been tagged, subjects have been tagged. And when you click on the people, you can actually view the biography of the people. This is wonderful, right? I clicked on that biography and now I can see every object or archive in the collection that is associated with that one person. Well, that's all wonderful, right? There is a lot of possibility to really link every item in the collection with people. What you should note though, is that the research field here only operates on the catalog. It doesn't operate on the accession. So if a gift has only been accessioned, but not catalogued, you're not gonna find what you're looking for. Let's look at a specific example. Here is a photograph of um, students. Each student is identified on this photograph. This, this, is, this is our online collection. Uh, we keep it our online collection at Flickr. Here's the uh, catalog record. It simply says the names of the student are all marked on the front of the photograph. It doesn't actually detail the names of the students. And there are no people linked in. And that's primarily what you're gonna find when uh, photographs such as these are cataloged. So if you asked, we go back, can you find, do you have a photograph of one of these students? the database is not gonna help you one iota. Now you might say, well, okay, that's your problem. This is a recent survey, the California Cultural Collection Protection Survey, and we'll give you a link to this report. You will note that amongst historical societies here, 67% of historical and cultural societies have less than 60% of their collection cataloged. You will also note that 95% cite that they need improvement in the cataloging of their collections. Now, not all institutions participated, few in Santa Cruz County did. Partly that's because like us, they don't have a good handle on the percentage of the collection cataloged. However, there is an online database of the results and you can look up individual institutions in which you're interested and we will also send you that link. The Santa Cruz Public Library did participate. They state that 75% of their um, collections are cataloged as did uh, California State Parks, Santa Cruz District, where they state 75% of their collection 
is cataloged. All right, I'm gonna pause to see if there are any questions at this point. Um, if not, we'll just continue. So Sarah, are there any questions? I don't see any, but just to remind everyone, you can go ahead and enter your questions in the Q&A icon down there at the bottom. If you're on a computer, you'll see a little Q&A icon. It has two little quote bubbles. That's where you enter your questions, and then we'll get to them uh, towards the end of the program since there aren't any right now. So go ahead, Lisa. Okay, great. Thank you. So thanks for hanging in there. And now we're going to move. So how did they actually find what, you'll, what you want them to find? Um, so typically, it's much easier to catalog an object than a photograph or an archive. So primarily, these institutions have objects cataloged, not photographs or archives. They use inventories as opposed to detailed collections data or catalog records. And they use bulk cataloging where they may uh, catalog a whole collection under a single catalog number. And we do that. Um, we have taken to doing that so that we can actually search the records. So we'll take a detailed inventory of a collection in one catalog record. So storytelling, using what we now know, what questions do we ask? Now, you can always start by asking very specific questions. Do you have anything in the archives pertaining to John Smith? But you may be disappointed, especially if your relatives like mine, primarily of factory workers, ranch hands, and so on, who did not make the school team, led uneventful lives, and probably had no published obituary. So I encourage you to ask more general questions, such as, do you have photographs of students around 1940? So here is an alumni directory. Again, this is cataloged as an alumni directory. It does not have the individual names. So you're gonna ask for an alumni directory, not do you have a record of a particular person. Here's uh, 1945 and you may notice um, that some of the names in the 1945 list appear on that photograph that I showed earlier, but not all of them. And it, it's a very interesting question, why are not all of them? Was this the graduating class? Was that the reason for the photograph? Well, it was because some of the boys enlisted when they turned 18 before they graduated, they enlisted in World War II. So what about other school records? Again, these are going to be all records where, oh, and that's a great icon. This is the uh, Boulder Creek Union High School. How about illustrating the story with a logo? Um, so we have class photographs. Again, the people are not identified. Yearbooks, newsletters, newspapers, teachers' record books, graduation programs, dance cards, theatrical and musical performances. Again, they're, they're, they are cataloged as those items, not as the people who appeared in those programs. Here's um, a typical uh, teacher's, teacher's book in the archive. Uh, we have 36 years of commencement programs starting in 1892. How about objects? I mentioned that objects are the easiest thing to catalog. So what about a school bell? This front, the, the bell at the front here is actually from uh, the Sequoia School here in Santa Cruz County. So maybe there's an artifact that could help illustrate your story. Um, maybe this was the school bell that summoned uh, the end of recess for your relative. How about other kinds of yearbooks? Um, and we have many in the collection.
Now, did your relative work or volunteer in an occupation in, in some way registered or had insignia? Um, a brand, a badge, because archives contain these and perhaps you could use a picture of an object to represent um, your relative. Maybe they worked in an industry. So here's an example, and this is not from our catalog, this is from another institution in Santa Cruz County. It's a branding iron. Um, it says, it's a branding iron 28 inches long, and it says P2. Well, branding irons, brands are all registered. So you can actually go look up in a database and find out uh, what the brands um, have, that have been registered are. Here is that same branding iron. It's now in the collection of the San Lorenzo Valley Museum. It actually says PS. And it was registered in uh, 1860 as the Paul Sweet um, branding iron. But where would you actually go to look? If, you, if this was your relative, would you come to the San Lorenzo Valley Museum? Probably not. But you might approach, say, the Ag History Museum or another agricultural history project in the state in which your relative lived. Again, a ranch sign, a milk bottle. Um, a statewide organization. And then, and again, they're not going to be cataloging these objects at a very detailed level. It might say a milk bottle that states, and then the name of the business. It's not necessarily going to say, it's the Sequoia Dairy owned by um, the Crawford family. So you need to be able to ask very general questions to be able to find things that might relate. Now, perhaps your relative was a member of an organization and historical societies have an enormous number of um, uh, records of local um, organizations. This is the Women's Christian Temperance Union. It's the constitution and roll book. Um, it was formed in the late 1890s, and you can see that they started by, I think it was probably the secretary that started writing the, the names down, but then it soon got to, you know, in, individuals who wrote their signatures um, uh, in, in the rule book. And so maybe your relative has their signature in um, a roster of an organization. Here is the uh, WCTU banner. Perhaps that would illustrate your story. You could include that. That banner would be the banner that for every meeting they stood up in front of and uh, stated their, um, their creed. Um, it must have been very important to those, uh, to the people of the, uh, the organization. Now, organizations, um, love scrapbooks and we have many many scrapbooks in the collection at the San Lorenzo Valley Museum. This is the um, Valley Garden Club, many many scrapbooks, awards, prizes, certificates, all sorts of things. This one, it's hard to see the, 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 the scope of this, but this is the Redwood Garden Club. That was a, um, an organization in Boulder Creek. Now this scrapbook must be um, like 20 inches tall by about 14 inches wide. And it's about three inches thick, it's huge. And every page is chock-a-block full of photographs with people identified. The catalog record is not going to mention all of the people that are mentioned in this scrapbook. But if you knew that your family member was interested in, um, uh, in gardening, in, perhaps they might have been a member 
or perhaps they would have attended one of the garden parties. Perhaps there's a photograph in this scrapbook of your relative. Business records and record books, gosh, we have a ton of these in the collection. So if your relative was part of a small community or even a small community in a much larger city, then perhaps there would have only been one or two places to purchase specific pro uh, products. This record book, and again, it's very large, it's probably about um, 17 inches by 13 inches, is the Russell and Lay Merchandise Record Book of Felton. 1900, here's a page out of 1900. And it has individual people's names, what they bought, exactly what they bought. Now, I was fascinated by these guys here, Sal Bellies, and because they appear here, Sal Bellies, and they're all down the page. And I wonder what the heck is a Sal Belly? Um, well, it's a Salmon Belly. Salmon was very popular. Perhaps again, something to illustrate your relative's story. Hotel registers, these are two very, again, very large. You can see how large these, these are like um, these three things here. These are bolts that hold the book together. It's that big. Um, the Boulder Creek House Register, that's this one, and the Manson House Lorenzo Hotel Register, that's, that's this guy here. So why did people stay at a hotel? Well, they were on vacation, they did for, if, if they were on business. Many seasonal workers would reside at a hotel, such as lumbermen. Um, they might be visiting a relative. It might be a special event. Or it might be simply that their house or their business burned down and they need to stay at, at the hotel. And in fact, at the Boulder Creek house, um, Joe Valesco, the blacksmith, stayed there after his blacksmith shop burned down. Often people who are thinking of purchasing a property in an area stay at a local hotel to scope out the market, to figure out where it is they actually want to purchase a lot. And so it's a good place to start if your family relocated from one area to another. So this is a page out of the Boulder Creek House um, Register. And you can see um, we've got Thursday, July 14th, we've just got a Teamster, one, one person, nobody on Friday. But then all of a sudden on Saturday, Tons of people. And we can see here, Andrew P. Hill, um, one of the founders of uh, the Simple Byron's stayed at this hotel. And, I, and I'm thinking, hmm. That's interesting. Let's take a look into that. Henry Middleton was a lumber baron in, uh, in Boulder Creek. And he was the owner of the land that eventually became Big Basin Redwood State Park. Now, Henry Middleton built a hotel in Boulder Creek called the Commercial Hotel. And it was that hotel that he hosted visiting delegations. This is a picture of the hotel, and this is a room key from that hotel. So it was confusing to me, why is Andrew P. Hill staying at the Boulder Creek house? when he was being hosted by Henry Middleton stay and, and should be staying at the commercial hotel. Well, we can find the answer by tying the date to a special event that was recorded in the Santa Cruz Sentinel. And I'm gonna quote the article. According to directions from headquarters, we met at Boulder Creek on Saturday, July 16. And though we filled the hotels there to overflowing, we were all made comfortable. Some at the Alpine, others at the commercial hotel, and the rest of us at the Boulder Creek house. 
So this was an article entitled Sempervirens Club Will Build House in Big Basin. What about other um, vacation events? Camps were incredibly popular here in the Santa Cruz Mountains, were popular all over the country. Perhaps a relative stayed at a resort. Uh, this, is, this is the um, uh, original um, brochure for the Camp Joy uh, Boys Resort in, uh, in Boulder Creek, but there were so many camps. What about other things that your relative might have enjoyed doing? Uh, maybe they enjoyed watching sports. Um, this is a sports uniform for the, from the Felton Merchants, um, a softball uniform, but we have baseball uniforms. We have all sorts in the collection. Maybe they enjoyed playing sports at a, a bowling alley. Again, the, as I mentioned, the objects are easier to catalog than the archives. So you might be able to illustrate your story with objects from the collection, as well as any archives that, um, that have been um, catalogued. All right, let's move on. Um, what do almost every, every community has tons of these cookbooks. Schools, PTAs, churches, historical societies, you can see the Mountain Arts Center has one here. Um, any society who wanted to fundraise, particularly during the specific era, 1980s, 1990s, uh, and produced a cookbook and perhaps your relative submitted a recipe. And lastly, what about original artwork? Archives such as ours contain very rich original artwork. So instead of a black and white photograph of Bean Creek, how about a beautiful um, oil painting on canvas of Bean Creek to illustrate your relative's um, uh, location? We have San Lorenzo Valley River um, uh, paintings, Boulder Creek paintings, some beautiful artwork that from you know, historic periods that, that could be used to illustrate your relative's um, environment. Okay, I'm gonna pause here for a moment um, and then I'm gonna go over less specifically, what else do we have in the archive? Just to give you a feel um, for uh, the types of collections that your typical historical society might hold. We have photographs. Oh boy, do we have photographs. We have about 50 clamshell binders um, of uh, photographs of the area. Um, most of these are catalogued, um, but in general terms. We have oversized photographs, frame photographs, we have photographic albums, or we have photographs mounted on album paper. We have digital-only photographs, that's where a family might have scrapbooks or photograph albums, and they're not yet ready to donate those to the museum, but we offer a scanning service so that we can actually put the digital material into the archive before, um, before it's lost, uh, just in case something happens to it. We have many, many unknowns, particularly people, in, uh, photographs of people, in the archives. We have about 5,000 photographs in the Freda Carr collection. Freda Carr was a um, photographer in the San Lorenzo Valley. She um, took photographs of organizations and there were way too many to, to list. She also uh, photographed for the Santa Cruz Sentinel and for local newspapers. 
most historical societies will also have collections such as these where they are photographs that have either come directly from a photographer or they have come from a newspaper. Um, so for example, at the Los Altos History Museum, they have a collection of photographs, again, hundreds of photographs, um, uh, eight, eight by tens um, of uh, images that were taken for the Los Altos News. And there we, um, we had Foothill College students uh, matching those images with newspaper articles because sometimes they use the, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the photograph, sometimes uh, the, the photograph was omitted, but there is an article about the photograph and matching them so that we could actually figure out what these were photographs of. So portraits of adults and children, wedding, pets, and organizations and events. Um, but we also have what I think is very special, and that is Freda Carr's personal collections of photographs, her, her, her own snaps, her own um, uh, family images, uh, which is, um, is pretty, pretty special. We have a lot of deeds. Um, so you might think, well, I need to go to the county um to, to to look up deeds but we actually have a lot of deeds in our collection and these are some of uh, the very interesting ones church records i love the way that the s is written back to front here um in this this was the uh so it's described as the, the Lorenzo M.E. Church. That's the Methodist Episcopal Church that was burned to the ground. Um, but uh, this is the secretary's book. And you can see there are multiple record books from, from the church. This is um, just Rubens. So each, each, um, each town would have a, a judge, a justice. And this is the justice in Boulder Creek. Um, and uh, this is a page from his record book, which is asking for the arrest of Andrew Dahl for um, uh, actually battery, which is quite interesting. Andrew Dahl was a wheelwright in, in Boulder Creek. Again, the record book would not contain those, those names. It, the, I'm sorry, the catalog record would not contain those names. It would simply say it was just in Ruben's record book. So now what about other, what I would describe as bulk collections? So those are collections that are, um, uh, perhaps have one accession rec record for the whole collection, more like an inventory. Um, we have four cubic feet of San Lorenzo Valley Chamber of Commerce um, records, 16 cubic feet of forestry records. We do have the Albert School archives, it's one cubic foot, but these did not burn with the school in the CZU fire. They were already in the collection of the San Lorenzo Valley Museum. We have collections from early residents. Um, one in particular is the Johnson collection. The Johnson family were the family that donated their property such that um, the Historical Society and the Boulder Creek Parks and Rec Department benefited uh, from the sale of their property. And it contains objects, archives, and artwork. We have research collections such as the California Powder Works collection, lots of directories, and boxes of clippings. These are what I describe as unprocessed collections. So they've had no inventory. They're a mixture of um, different materials. Um, they have broad contents, photographs, certificates, um, uh, often checks, um, bill of sale, um, some, some uh, objects too. Um, the blue book that you see just here is actually shorthand. Um, everything is in shorthand. I, I have no idea of the content because I don't speak shorthand, but um, 
but you, you get the idea that these are unprocessed collections. We, ha we have a lot of them. And then we have um, historical newspapers, um, The Boulder Blast, Mountain Echoes, Community. Community was a newspaper that was done by the high school, The Valley Echo, SW Journal, SW Sun, The Torrent, Penny Press, Reporter, you get the idea. We've got a lot of newspapers in the collection. And the goal is for those newspapers that have not um, been digitized, that, uh, that we will have them digitized. In fact, we very recently did a, a grant application to uh, California Reveal to have the uh, community newspapers from the high school digitized. Keep your fingers crossed. We hope that uh, they accept that uh, application. Um, this, is the, this is the newspaper. This, um, it, it looks like a, a, you know, a, 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 a regular newspaper, not a, not a newsletter, not a school newsletter. This is a newspaper. We have 52 bound copies in, a, you know, or bound neatly um, for one year's worth, plus uh, some loose copies too. Um, see, it covers not just Boulder Creek, but Ben Lomond and Fulton News and Brookdale News too. And of course, we have, just as the Genealogy Society has, we have people files. And these are files that are stored alphabetically by surname um, uh, with uh, um, information on family trees, information on burials, information on schooling, um, all sorts of different things. So um, what we call our people, people files. Multiple, multiple drawers of these. So that ends my presentation, is my contact information. Um, so, Sarah, do we have any questions? We do. Your first one says, does your museum charge for inquiries? No, we do not. Uh, not only do we not charge for inquiries, we do not charge to do any scanning for you. We feel that um, that's a benefit to us. Anything that is mission based for our museum is free. So doing research requests, providing you with photographs um, or images, it's all completely free. OK, and then the second part of that says, what if something is found? So I guess what they want to know is, is there a cost if you nope. find the item? Nope, not at all. Um, so what we would typically do is if it's an archive or a photograph, we would scan it for you and email it to you. If it's an object, we would photograph it for you and send you that photograph. OK, and then they'd like to know if you're open this weekend. Yes, um, the museums are open at uh, both locations, both the Felton and Boulder Creek location. Um, and I can talk a little bit about that when I, when I, I close out. Um, but be aware, our docents do not have access to the archives. So if it's the archives that you want to get at, gain access to, you want to send us an email so that we can make you an appointment, so that we can be sure to be able to share the archives with you. And then what's the best email? Is it for them to go to the slvmuseum.org and get the email address? Yes, definitely, for sure. Okay, and then your next, you have two, um, it's a two-part question. It says, does your collection have items from the entire county of Santa Cruz, and in particular, Watsonville? Um, so really, that's a, that's a tough question because we do um, have uh, collection, we have items that do span the, um, the, 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 the whole county. Um, I am trying to think specifically about Watsonville and I'm not thinking, I mean, some of our families, for example, they tend to move. So they, they would start out, say in Santa Cruz, they'd move up the San Lorenzo Valley. Then they would go, they would move the, as they get older, and this is a typ very typical progression. Then they, they move up the valley, then they move back to Santa Cruz, and then they spread out to other places in, 
in Santa Cruz County. So for very personal collections, often they do span um, a larger area for sure. Um, uh, as far as specifically Watsonville, I'm not thinking of any, I can't think of anything offhand, a particular collection that I could say um, would, uh, uh, would, would span, would um, address Watsonville. Um, some of the newspapers, of course, requote the Pajaro Valley Times. So you'll get newspaper articles. So if you've got a maybe a hall in the Pajaro Valley Times and you say, oh gosh, they, you know, they just didn't have that copy when they digitized that, um, that article might have appeared in, a, in, a, in another local newspaper. Okay, and I would like to verify the email. So on the website, I found slbhm at cruzio.com. Is that the best email for them to? Yes, and they can also use slbmuseum at sbcglobal.net. Okay, and then your next question says, does the archive have anything from Año Nuevo area, sawmills, rooming houses, etc.? Yes, we do have a lot of information on sawmills. Um, in fact, we've been... Um, we've been enhancing a study that was done in 1976 on the sawmills in the Santa Cruz Mountains that was done as part of a UCSC um, uh, thesis uh, document. And, and, and they, there was a spreadsheet. It, it, the spreadsheet had um, you know, around about 250, I don't remember the exact number, uh, 250 um, listed sawmills in, in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, we've been, uh, Looking at that list, trying to consolidate because sawmills moved, um, they were leased. Um, so one sawmill might be known by multiple names. Um, so what in actual fact we found was that in, rather than consolidating the list, the list has now grown uh, and it's, it's probably around about 500 sawmills now that we have listed for the Santa Cruz Mountains. But yeah, it does, it, it, it's the whole of the area, not just uh, the San Lorenzo Valley. Okay, next and, question. Oh, I'm sorry. And, and, and we do have photographs that span um, uh, the, the whole of Santa Cruz County as far as um, uh, uh, logging goes. And I should say there's a, a really, really interesting collection at the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History in scrapbooks um, uh, 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 that, that depicts um, um, logging in the Davenport area um it's uh I, I can i can send you the link to that it's a really um, it's it's actually in the uh the uh, redwood logging and conservation in the santa cruz mountains that's history journal number seven um some some great images because what's so fascinating about that family was that the women in the family were um were uh, active in the logging industry um and there's some great photographs of them you know, next to a steam donkey, for example, all sorts, yeah. Okay, the next question says, any advice on what kinds of materials the museum might be interested in for donation? Can you clarify the scope of the collection? Yes, um, and that's really, that's a really important question. Um, you know, we are focused on the history of the San Lorenzo Valley in relationship to the Santa Cruz Mountains, and that is pretty much the scope of the collection. Um, we, um, you know, we will accept donations of items that are have um, a relationship to the San Lorenzo Valley, the Santa Cruz Mountains, and Santa Cruz County, depending on the context. Um, but we also do accept donations if it illustrates something important that our school group program um, uh, might be in need of. So for example, uh, the K2 through K2 through three program is a compare and contrast, comparing what life was like a um, uh, hundred years ago with what life is like today. So if it's something that might illustrate a point, uh, then we will, ex we, we will potentially accept that as uh, into the collection, but primarily we are very focused on um, illustrating the, his the local history. Okay. 
Next question says, do you have any suggestions for finding local archives in other cities too? Our family spans multiple areas in California and we have photos and scrapbooks from all over the state. Yeah, I think um, I think that's a that's a really good question. Also, um, most uh, most states have a um, an organization that uh, um, local uh, institutions uh, become a part of. In in California, it's the California Association of Museums. So I would start with uh, at the state level, and and find out who are members of the state. Um, uh, organization because uh, they are most likely to be the holders of uh, the archives and also the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the IMLS, um, they will list the archives that are part of libraries. Um, but each state will have, uh, um, you know, a, uh, a repository. Um, for example, in California, we have the Online Archive of California. Uh, where many institutions post um, uh, post material, um, and, and, and most states will have something similar. Well, if you have a question for Lisa, go ahead and type it into the Q&A. So you just click on the Q&A icon. You might need to click on Ask a Question um, in the upper right corner if you're on a mobile device, but go ahead and type in your question. So Sarah, um, while we're waiting for any more questions, if it's okay, I'd like to just close with perhaps what's on exhibit in the two locations. Um, so we'd really like for all of you to um, visit our museum galleries. Uh, in Felton, we have a, a temporary exhibition called Birth Happens, which celebrates the history of midwifery in Santa Cruz County. That's been an amazing project. We've been collecting oral histories as part of that project. It's documenting the history of midwifery in Santa Cruz County from uh, the pre-contact time to the present. It's examining midwifery legislation, especially focusing on the 1917 decision to identify birth as a medical procedure and its implications, and the 1976 California Supreme Court decision to make the practice of non-medical midwifery illegal. That was all done right here in Santa Cruz County. It identifies the women who took the practice of home birthing here in the Santa Cruz Mountains and created the Santa Cruz Birth Center, but who were ultimately arrested and jailed uh, for conducting non-medical home births. So the Santa Cruz um, Supreme, the, sorry, the California Supreme Court decision is called the Boland decision, named after Kate Boland, a uh, Santa Cruz uh, midwife who is helping to uh, curate this ex exhibition. At the gallery in Boulder Creek and online, we're hosting Gadgets Galore, a traveling exhibition from Exhibit Envoy and Heather Farquhar that encourages visitors to take a closer look at historic gadgets and consider how those gadgets of yesteryear informed our modern technology. So that's actually a fun exhibition exploring um, objects in the collection uh, and, uh, and, and how they have affected um, or, it, um, or uh, um, informed modern technologies today. Is there any further questions? It doesn't look like that, but I would like to direct everyone to the chat. So if you click on the chat icon, you'll see some links. There's the email address so that you can email the museum. The museum's website is in there as well as on your screen. And also Gail typed in that universities have archives pertinent to the area where they are located. So go ahead and check out the information in the chat, and then we'll also be sending it to you in an email. So for everyone who's registered, we'll send out those links as well. So if you weren't able to type everything or write everything down out of the chat, we'll send them to you. The other thing you can do is while we still have the meeting open, you can save those links to, um, you know, your bookmarks if you, you know, navigate. Uh, that way. Otherwise, we'll send them to you in an email.
So Lisa, I'll let you know if any other questions uh, come up. Thank you. Oh, it does look like it says, uh, how did the museum come by the Lorenzo Hotel Ledger? Um, that was a very, uh, very early uh, donation. Many of the early donations, unfortunately, uh, the donor information was not recorded. So they fall into what we call our general collection, i.e. we don't know what year they were donated prior to 2003. Um, we don't know who the donor was. And um, uh, we have very little information, very little provenance information on them. And we unfortunately have a lot of artifacts in the collection that fall into that category. Um, uh, we do, you know, some of the items that come from, that are in the collection do come through families, um, or they were just handed in the early days, in the, in the early, you know, in the 1970s, 1980s, to members of the historical society, and they just didn't have a paper trail set in place. So, yeah, it's, it's very unfortunate. Well, on the topic of the Lorenzo Hotel ledger, someone would like to know, is there anything else interesting in the ledger? Um, I, you know, that's a really difficult question for me to answer because I find it also interesting, just the names of the people that are in there, the, um, the, 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 uh, so I should add that the Lorenzo Ledger started out as the Manson House. The Manson House was in Santa Cruz. So the Manson House actually went out of business and the Lorenzo Hotel bought the ledger. So the first few pages of this are of the Manson House in Santa Cruz. Then it flips over to the Lorenzo Hotel. So I don't know. It's, it's all very interesting. And then they'd also like to know if you have a quick backstory to the hotel that you could share. Well, we have photographs of the hotel. We know it burned, um, unfortunately. Um, but uh, no, I don't have a, a backstory. And then one of our attendees said, thank you for the fabulous information so much that I didn't know. Well, I think it's, it, 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 if, you, if you put on the, the hat that you, you, you know, that first of all, objects are easier to catalog than archives, then you can illustrate your genealogy story with objects. Um, and, and I would really recommend people think about how to do that. But the other thing is, um, to be honest, if you ha have an idea that your relative is represented in the newsletters of a school or an organization, maybe the Next question is, could you possibly volunteer your time to catalog those items and list those names so that other people can find um, information about their relatives too? Um, because that's what we all need. All of us, all of the institutions need people to volunteer to catalog um, those records. Well, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. So if you have some closing comments, Lisa, I know you said you had a closing. Um, yeah, I think I've been over that. So maybe Gail, you, I know Gail has some closing remarks. I have closing remarks. <laughs> First of all, Lisa, I wanna thank you for a very interesting presentation. I'm sure many of us look forward to visiting the San Lorenzo Valley Museum soon and I appreciate that you've explained how we might uh, use the specific examples that you showed from the San Lorenzo Valley Museum and our own research in other geographic areas of the country. I hope to visit similar archives as I travel, travel to ancestral locations. Ms. Robinson has kindly permitted us to post the handout from tonight's lecture on the genealogical website. So look at it for it there. 
And when you visit the website, you will also find the membership application form there. If you are not already a member of the Genealogical Society of Santa Cruz County, we cordially invite you to join our group. Thank you for being with us this evening. Please join us again on the first Tuesday of next month, October 5, at 7 p.m. for Kathy Nielsen's presentation, A New Life for Old Photos, Identifying, Organizing, and Restoring Photos. And then Sarah, I think you will show how to register for the programs on the library's website. To yep, register so for next month's program, all you need to do is enter your first and last name, your email address, and then click the optional small yes box, which allows the Genealogy Society of Santa Cruz County to send you more information about a variety of events you might be interested in attending. Once you click the blue register button, which is shown there at the bottom, you will receive the Zoom information for the next program. Thank you again for joining us this evening. And thank you to Sarah and Victor for your assistance.